Take your Bibles once again and go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I hope that as we've been going through this book chapter by chapter, it's helped uh, you understand the Bible a little bit more. I hope it's helped you study your own Bible as you're reading through the gospel. And some of these things that are challenging, I hope they've come uh, to light a little bit more. And uh, look, it's the same thing. In chapter 18, you're gonna, there's, there's a story here. We're going to look at it very soon. <clears throat> a story that's very uh, commonly preached, but it's very commonly preached incorrectly. All right. So as we go to it, you'll understand why. And we'll touch upon that later on. But look at verse number 1. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. The Bible says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The title for the sermon tonight is Greatest in the Kingdom. All right. So it's an interesting question. The disciples come to Jesus. Jesus, you know, out of all of us, who's going to be the greatest? So, you know, we think of the disciples. We think of these men as great men of God. You know, Peter and, and John and, and so on. You know, Philip and Bartholomew and, and uh, you know, all, all of these men. And uh, we see immediately just how immature they are. You know, there's still uh, a place in them that they need to grow. They need to mature. They're comparing themselves one to the other and asking Jesus, who's going to be the greatest? This isn't the first time that this question gets brought to Jesus. All right. And um, I don't know about you. I mean, you might say, I don't really struggle with that. I, I don't really think about, you know, am I going to be greater than others in the church? But you know what? In my Christian life, I've definitely come across people who feel that way. I've definitely come across believers who serve the Lord or, you know, uh, say they love the Lord. They, they, they do the works that God has given them and they don't, they're not satisfied to know I'm just serving the Lord. They also want to know how well am I doing with other people? You know, is this person of do, doing less soul winning? And if they're doing less, then surely I'm greater. Now, you might not say that out loud, but in the hearts of many people, that's how they feel. This is why quite often you'll go to a church and you'll see mature Christians look down on younger Christians. You know, Christian people come into church, they're not dressed properly, they're not, they're not, they don't know the hymns, they don't know the Bible, they might be newer Christians. And sometimes you see mature Christians turn down their nose, look down at that person and, and, you know, think of themselves as great. Okay. And so, yeah, they might not ask the question, but in the hearts of a lot of believers, and it might be in your heart, if it is in your heart, you need to overcome this. You know, but it, it, you, you'll see how immature it is to ask Christ who's going to be the greatest. Now, should we desire to be great people? Absolutely. We should desire to be great people in the Lord. We should desire to have those heavenly rewards to come. But look how Jesus responds to them in verse number two. Verse number two. Does Jesus say, well, you know, keep working hard, you know, keep doing what you're doing and that will guarantee you to be great? No, what does Jesus do in verse number two? And Jesus called a little child unto him. And set him in the midst of them. All right, it takes a little child. Now, before we, we go into why he brought that little child in the midst, all I want to say here is one thing you'll notice about Jesus is when he was going around teaching and preaching, the little children were present. Okay? And that's another thing, guys. In church, we want our children here. We want the little children here. This is so you'll see soon why it's so important, okay? But a lot of churches remove the children from the congregation, put them in a Sunday school, you know, away from the church services. Why? Because children are loud, children can be distracted, and all those kinds of things. No, we see that Jesus, when he preached, he had children there right there. He took the little child and placed them in the midst of the disciples, okay? And the, the, the illustration will be there. He's going to point to this child soon and say, this child's the greatest, Right? Uh, so he really rubs it into the face of the disciples. We'll have a look at it there in verse number three. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you see the, the disciples saying, Who's going to be the greatest? Jesus says, Look, more important than who's going to be the greatest, are you even going to enter the kingdom? The first thing you need to do is be converted, become like a little child. And that will guarantee you to even to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why is that so important? Because little children are humble, right? Little children here, they believe. This is why when you go soul, door to door soul winning, it's so much easier to see little children saved. It's so much easier to see young teenagers saved. But once an adult reaches an, an, you know, an older life, once they've lived their life, they've provided for themselves, you know, they, they don't think they need God, they become hardened, they become prideful. You see, little children are humble. Little children find it easy to place their faith on Jesus Christ, okay? 
This is why he sets a child in their midst and says, look, you've got to become a little child even to enter into the kingdom. Okay? You must put your full trust on the Lord God, your full trust on Jesus Christ. Now let's look at verse number four. Verse number four. The Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, in order for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be humble, right? You must come to realize, I can't make it to heaven on my own merits. I can't bring my works. I can't bring my righteousness. I can't bring my, my reformed life to Christ. He's not going to receive that. They're like filthy rags. I must come humbly before the Lord and accept Him as my Savior. You know, that same humility, the same humility that drives you to be saved is required for you to become the greatest in heaven. Okay, what's humility? Putting yourself lower before other people. You see, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, when we get there, it's not going to be those that proclaim their works. It's not going to be those that, that talk about how great they were and the great works they did. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven are going to be the believers that were the most humble. Quite often, the believers that are the most humble, the believers that are the most quiet, they're the ones that are serving the Lord with all their heart. More often, they're serving the Lord, but they don't want anyone else to know about it. You know, it's just between them and the Lord. They don't need to impress anybody. They don't need to uh, lift themselves up with pride. They do it through humility. And verse number five, please. Verse number five. Verse number five. So if a little humble child can be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, what does Jesus say in verse number five? He says, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. See, Jesus puts that child and says, this is child, this child, we could, because of his humility, is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. If you receive that little child, Jesus says, you receive me. Why is that? Because that little child is a believer of Christ. You know, and this is the thing, you know, as someone who thinks you want to be great in the kingdom, you want to have your names in lights, you know, quite often what happens? You know, let's say you've got a guest preacher coming around, right? I'm not against guest preachers or some guest pastor, someone with a reputation, someone with a great name. Quite often, you'll see people that like to suck up to them, right? You'll see people after the service come up, oh, you're the greatest preacher. You've changed my life. You've done all these amazing things. You see, quite often when someone with a big name comes, everyone wants to get around and be recognized by that great name. And you know what? Little children in the congregation quite often get, get, get dismissed. Little children in the congregation, you know, get ignored. Why? They're just a child. Who cares? The guest preacher is here. You know what Jesus says? He says, yeah, you probably want to receive me because he's the greatest. He's the greatest and he's God, God Almighty. Of course, we want to acknowledge God. Of course, we want to honor Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ says, if you want to honor me, if you want to respect me, you go for the little child. You go and receive the little child in my name. You receive him. You encourage him. You honor that child. And this is something we need to be reminded of in church is that the children in our church are important. They're the next generation of Christians. Hey, they can do greater works than what we can do in our generation. If we train them to love the Lord, we receive them. Listen, if a child comes to church and they feel accepted by the adults, accepted by the teenagers, don't you think they'll love to be in church? Don't you think they'll design, hey, I want to be like them, I want to grow up and, and serve the Lord. Hey, but if you ignore the children, say, who cares, they're not important. They're not going to want to be in church. They're going to grow up one day as teenagers. And quite often in a lot of churches, you see the teens grow up and not want to be in church. They, they leave the church and you, you never see them for years. You know, sometimes they come back. Praise God when they come back. But quite often they come back, they destroy the life, you know, with a life of sin. Jesus Christ makes a very important point. Children are important. Hey, they can be distracting sometimes. I acknowledge that. Okay. But you receive the little ones, you're receiving Christ. Verse number six. And verse, and verse number six confirms that this child, this little child that he's referring to, is a believer of Christ. He's a saved child. Verse number six. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. See, there he is. He's a believer of Christ. He's saved. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, quite often we think about this and, and what, you know, what's a, what's a millstone? A, a millstone, you know, before our modern machinery um, you know, to grind wheat, they would use these huge stones, these huge stones that were at least 50 kilograms in weight, you know. And Jesus says, look, it's better if someone comes and offends a little child that believes on him, it's better for just a, that, that stone be hanged around his neck and is thrown into the sea. He's saying, look, you're better off dead. 
You know, if you, if, if you mislead children, if you offend little children uh, against the Lord, you know, you, you discourage little children, you're better off dead, is what Jesus Christ says. That's pretty harsh words from Jesus Christ. That's how he feels about it, okay? And this is something that quite often that's brought up when people preach against pedophiles, when people preach against sexual predators that come into churches seeking for, uh, to, to corrupt the minds of little children. You know, this is, you know, this is something we need to be aware of because... You see, uh, uh, churches will bring the best of people, but churches will also bring in the worst of people. Because quite often, you know, the predators, those that seek to offend uh, Christians and offend little children, they'll come into a church because they think, well, everyone's friendly, everyone's going to receive me, I'll be able to get away with my perversions, I'll be able to get away with my, uh, you know, my, my sinful acts. And we as a church... As we continue to grow, you know, uh, right now, you know, I, I know all of you, but there's going to come a time when our church starts to grow, continues to grow. There'll be new people that we don't know. Hey, you know, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't encourage people to come. We should be uh, inviting. We should be hospitable toward people. But nevertheless, we always need to be aware uh, uh, who's around our little children. You know, parents, I would always say, never leave your children unsupervised, even in church. Okay, please. Don't think uh, this church is a safe place to leave my children unsupervised. No. You know, sexual pre- pre- uh, predators seek churches to harm little children. And these perverts, these people that are better off dead in the ocean, as Jesus Christ uh, speaks of here. Verse number 7. Jesus says, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to, uh, woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. So what Jesus Christ is saying here is that woe to the world. You know, the world is the one that comes to offend Christians, that comes to offend believers. But that shouldn't surprise us because in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You see, if you live for Jesus Christ, if you live as a Christian, the Bible guarantees that you will suffer persecution. You might say, Pastor Kevin, you know, I've lived a Christian life for you know, two decades, three decades, I've not suffered any persecution. Probably because you've not lived for Christ. You know, uh, probably because, you, you know, you've just gone on the radar. You know, you, you've just been like the world. Of course, if you're operating just like the world, you're not going to suffer persecution. Hey, but if you stand for the word of God, hey, if you walk the ways of Christ, guaranteed, you're going to suffer persecution. Right. Guaranteed. Yep. You know, just this morning, I got a phone call from some guy on the Sunshine Coast, you know, uh, trying to blame us for his house getting burgled. You know, trying to blame our church because we left a gospel tract, you know, and, and he's saying, well, you know, someone's walked past and saw that no one's home and they burgled the house. You know, he wasn't expecting to get the harsh words he got in return. I'll just say that, okay? But look, the world wants to attack the churches. They especially want to attack those that go out and preach the gospel. And uh, so Jesus Christ is basically confirming here offenses will come. Okay, get ready, toughen up, you know, grow closer to the Lord, mature, grow up because when offenses come, you'll be better prepared to overcome those. Verse number eight. And these are some interesting words and uh, some people struggle with this. It's not that difficult to, to understand really, but verse number eight, it says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Now, uh, keep your finger there and turn to 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I can't believe there are some people, all right, even Baptists, that take what we just read there and think this is literal, all right? That if you've done something sinful, then you're better off cutting off, literally cutting off your hand so you can enter into heaven without sin. Okay. Now, do you, I mean, does that sound very foreign to you? Like if, if, you know, if you went to someone and said, what must I do to be saved? And someone says, you know, have you looked with lust? Yes. Well, you've got to pluck out your eyes. That's how you can get saved. I mean, that's very foreign. That's very extreme, right? But there are some people that actually believe that. And, you know, there's this guy on the internet. I don't know if you ever listened to online preachers. His name's Robert Breaker. Okay, he's a Baptist. He's a preacher online. And he has said, basically, those that live in the tribulation period, if they've taken the mark of the beast on their hand, well, the only way they can get saved now 
is to cut off their hand, all right? Or if they take the mark of the beast in their forehead, you've got to cut off your head. I mean, you, do you think that's what Jesus Christ is teaching? Of course not, okay? Now, the reason I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 is just to bring us back to some fundamental truths. If we, again, if we stick to our fundamental truths, our fundamental doctrines, everything else in the Bible makes sense, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. The Bible says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, this physical body, this flesh and blood, will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not going to heaven in this body. It's not going to happen. Okay? That's, that's a basic truth. Okay, this is why the Bible talks about the resurrection, the rapture, the new body. It says here that, uh, what did it say at the end? Neither doth corruption, so this body is corrupted, inherit incorruption. Incorruption is heaven. This corrupted body cannot inherit something that's incorruptible. Otherwise, what was incorruptible would become corruptible because it allowed something corruptible into it. Okay, this is why we need new resurrected bodies. Okay, because once we have those sinless bodies, then yes, bodily, physically, we can be in heaven. All right. So if you take that, that's a basic truth. The rapture, resurrected bodies. Most Christians know this. They understand this. Then do you think cutting off your hand or plucking your eye out is going to help you get to heaven? No, because this body was never going there in the first place. All right. Now let's uh, quickly drop down to verse 51. So we just read 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Talking about bodies here. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So how are we going to be changed? Incorruptible. We're going to be incorruptible just like heaven is incorruptible. That's how we enter into, the, into heaven bodily, physically, by the resurrection with our new incorruptible bodies. Okay. So if that's the basic teaching of the Bible. Of course, if you know that, when you read about Jesus Christ saying plucking out your hand or you know, cutting off your hand, you'll know he cannot be talking literally because the body was never going to heaven in the first place. All right. So let's just, if you go back to uh, Matthew 18, please, Matthew 18. Let's go back, to, back there. So what is Jesus Christ teaching? Of course, he's teaching about the horrors of hell. Okay? If, it, if it were possible for you to cut off your hand, as it were, so you could you know, avoid hell and just let that one, one hand go to hell, you're better off cutting off your hand than suffering the horrors of hell. That's what Jesus Christ is teaching. He's, he's giving us a very graphic description, you know, so you can understand just how, how, uh, you know, yeah, just how horrible hell is. You know, you'd rather avoid that place at any cost. And if it were possible to do those things, you're better off doing that than letting your whole body go to hell, okay? So, of course, look, cutting off your hands, plucking your eyes, it's very graphic. It's horrible. You wouldn't want to do it yourself. You wouldn't want your worst enemies doing it them, you know, themselves, right? So, if, if you wouldn't want that to happen, then how much more would you rather people avoid hell? How much more would you rather go out there preaching the gospel? So people can know what they must do to be saved. And it's not cutting off their hands, right? It's being like what we just read about. Being that humble little child coming to Jesus Christ and receiving his sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection. Being humble as that child. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. So Jesus Christ, see, he's still talking about the little ones. Still talking about the little, little child. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels, whose angels? The angels of the little ones, do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Say, so what is that about? I'll tell you the truth, I'm not 100% sure, okay? But it sounds like little children have what some people call guardian angels. That, that God the Father loves little children so much especially those that have believed on Jesus Christ, love them so much that he has appointed an angel to watch over that child. Okay? This is why when Christ says you receive the little child, you receive me, we see just how important little children are to God and they should be important to us as well. Okay? Now, what does that mean? Can you explain that any further? I really can't because we don't have any other scriptures that really develop this point. Okay, but it looks like what it, what it says there, there are angels for the little ones, for the little children. Verse number 11, 
Now, this is the verse that I said to you, a lot of people quote, and I know what they mean. They mean well, they have a sincere heart, but they quote it, they, or they teach on it incorrectly. And of course, this was the memory verse. It says, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. All right? So a lot of people will take this verse, because, you know, a lot of modern day preaching, you know, you don't get preaching chapter by chapter like we get today, right? A lot of modern day preaching, you know, you, let's say you're preaching on the gospel, you take a verse here, a verse there, a verse there, maybe five verses, and most of the sermon is just somebody talking, okay? And what, what the problem is, when that happens, they'll take beautiful verses like verse 11 and take it out of its context and teach about something else. And quite often, verse 11, when it's taken out, is taught about salvation of the soul. You know, that, that God has come to seek and to save those that are lost, like those that are going to hell, okay? But if we keep it in the context of what we're reading, what is God talking about here? He's talking about the little children. And those little children He spoke about, they already were believers in Christ. Jesus, what Jesus Christ is teaching about here are believers, Okay, children of God. He's not talking about those that are unsaved. He's talking about children of God that are lost. Say, what do you mean by lost? Well, what we just read about, keep it all in context. That Jesus Christ is uh, rebuking those that would offend little ones. Rebuking those that would turn their hearts against the Lord. You know, so much so that it'd be better if they drowned in the ocean, drowned in the sea. Okay, let's understand a couple of things here. You see, when little children are offended in a church, when little children are offended by other people, like I said, many of times they'll leave a church. Many times they'll be backslidden. Many times they'll leave, you know, uh, leave God altogether and think, well, you know, this is not the life for me. This is not the way I want to walk. And in a sense, they become lost. You know, we'll use the phrase backslidden many times in the Bible. And if we keep reading the context, you'll see that this is true. That this is speaking about a backslidden or lost child of God. And why they're lost is because they've been offended by other people. That's why God says that He has He shines His face on little children. We'll have a look at this very shortly. Look at verse number 12. Verse number 12. How think ye? So Jesus Christ is asking us a question. What do you think, He's saying? What's He asking? If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them is gone astray... Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? He goes, what do you think? Let's say you're a shepherd. You had a job to do. You started with a hundred sheep, right? You're leading those hundred sheep to its green pastures to eat. And at the end of the day, you count them all up. There's ninety nine and there's one missing. What do you think? Would you go after the one? Now, I, I, I think Jesus Christ is asking this question because, I, look, if it was me, if at the end of the day I had 99 left and I lost one, I'd be like, oh, I got 99. I'd, I'd be happy that I still got the vast majority. I've lost one. Well, I mean, just one. It's not going to be a big deal. I mean, if you got $100 in your pocket and you lose a dollar somewhere, are you really going to be like that bothered? You got $99 still there. You know, I mean, if you lost a dollar, you probably could, oh, whatever. You know, what do you think? You know, that's what Jesus Christ is saying, okay? Now, let's look at verse number, verse number 13. Verse number 13. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Look at this. Even so, it is not. So Jesus Christ is now comparing this, this parable, this story, with what he's been preaching before. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What are the little ones? Remember, the, w- the little one that Jesus Christ brought before the midst of the apostles. The, w- the little ones that believe on Christ. Okay? You see, what God is saying here is that, first of all, in the story, He's got a hundred sheep. Those sheep already belong to the shepherd. You know, if you're not saved, you are not a child of God. If you are not saved, you are not his sheep. You are not of his fold. It's not till that you're saved, you become born again and you become a child of God. Okay, that's when, that's how you belong to God. That's how you become a sheep of his fold. That's how you become a child of God. And so Jesus Jesus, uh, Jesus is giving the analogy here. If he's got a hundred, you know, people, let's say in a church, a hundred of his children and one goes missing. One gets lost because he's offended. All right that he would leave the 99 and go seek after that one. 
That's how much God loves us. That's how much God wants us to fellowship with Him, to walk with Him, that if you get backslidden one day, if one day in your life you're out of church, one day in your life you're discouraged, pastors have let you down, whatever churches have let you down, and, and, and you're out and about, you, just, you don't know what to do with your life, one thing I want you to remember is that God is seeking you again. Okay, he's seeking you like that shepherd looking after that one. Now, I'm probably not going to look after you, look out, look for you, right? I, I mean, I, I hope so, but honestly, I mean, like I said, if I lost one sheep, I'll be happy for the 99. I'll probably be working hard for the 99, but God would leave the 99 that haven't gone astray and go seek after that one. You know, God's got an amazing love, an amazing love for his children, for his sheep. Now, if you're not yet con uh, you know, convinced that this is talking about a backslidden or lost Christian, I mean, you should be. If you keep it in the context, that's what he's talking about, the little ones that have believed on him, right? Just keep your finger there, and I just want to just reinforce this uh, for you. Please go to the book of Luke. Keep your finger there. Go to Luke. Let me just see if I can find the reference very quickly. I'm not sure if I took it down. I'll, I'll go there. It might be Luke 16. From memory. Uh, sorry, guys, just bear with me. Well, what I'll do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that for now. If somebody has the time to go through Luke and find the other parable of the lost sheep, I'll really appreciate it. We'll come back to it. So I'll, I'll keep preaching. If somebody can go to Luke, I can't remember the chapter right now, it, uh, and find the other parable of the lost sheep, uh, that would be great, okay? If we don't get to it, we don't get to it, but it would be great if you can. If you go back to Matthew 18, please. Matthew 18 and verse 15. Matthew 18, verse 15. Remember the context did we find it? Is it Luke 15? Yeah. Luke 15. All right, let's go to Luke 15 quickly. Luke 15. Because I just want to drill this home for you. Because there is a lot of bad teaching here uh, from, from different preachers that you'll find. Yeah, Luke 15. Okay? Jesus Christ gives many parables, all right? The parable of the lost sheep is in verse number 3. Okay? We're not going to read it all again. But look at verse number 4 quickly. What man of you having a hundred sheep... If you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. So I just want to draw the attention once again. This is a shepherd with a hundred sheep and he loses one. Okay. Now let's drop down. Drop down to verse number eight. Verse number eight. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. So Jesus Christ gives us all these parables. They're all teaching the same story. Now, this time the woman, she owns 10 pieces of silver. Okay, those 10 pieces of silver already belong to her and she's lost one. You see that? Now, let's keep going. We get to the most popular parable now in, in uh, the parable of the, uh, of the uh, lost son. It says here in uh, verse number, number 11, verse number 11, uh, Luke 15, verse 11, and he said... A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided them to his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. You guys know that parable, where the, where the son goes and, and he leaves the father, he takes his inheritance, wastes it all, and then he comes back to the father. Okay? Now, the reason I, I told you, you can turn there to Luke 15, we have these three parables. First, it starts with a with hundred, losing one. Then we have the woman with ten, losing one. And then the father with two sons, losing one. Okay? And every time, you know, that the one that was lost is found. But in all of these parables, those things that were lost belong to the owner already to begin with. The sheep belong to the shepherd. The, 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 the uh, talent, was it? Belonged to the woman who lost it. And the son was obviously the, already a son of the father. The only way you can become a son of the Father is by believing on Christ. Amen. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that in Luke 15, and then just bring our attention back to Luke, uh, Matthew 18, please. Matthew 18, Matthew 18, verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 15. Again, believers, 
We're talking about believers and we're talking about people that offend, okay, that persecute, that offend. But now Jesus Christ is driving this home to a local church, okay? No longer about the world offending believers, but believers offending believers. And you know what? I, I know this church, we're not even a year old. Maybe it's already happened. If it hasn't happened, it will happen, all right? It will happen that you will get offended by another brother or sister in this church at some point in time, okay? Or maybe offended by me. Or maybe you'll offend me, okay? It's going to happen. I promise you. I promise. You might be new to church. Go, oh, man, this is awesome. And we're brothers and sisters. We're on the same page. We're like-minded. This is going to be awesome. That's my new family. I promise you one day you're going to get offended, right? <laughs> it's going to happen. And so Jesus Christ knows this, which is why he teaches us this in chapter 18, verse number 15. <coughs> Verse number 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his faults between thee and him alone. This is important. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So what's the teaching of Christ? If you get offended by a brother, a brother or sister in the Lord, what are you to do? Are you to go and tell the rest of the church? Are you to go and tell all your friends? Are you to go and tell the pastor, pastor, brother such and such did this to me, sister, sister, sister so and so did this to me. No, the Bible said here, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Okay, that is step number one in sorting out conflicts between brethren. When brethren offend you, you go to that person alone. Please, take heed. You do this, the Bible says, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. I'll tell you now. 99% of your personal conflicts will be resolved if you just do this first step. Okay, you just go to that person. Most people are reasonable. You go to someone and say, look, you've hurt me, you've offended me, you say these words, maybe not even intentionally. Okay, maybe you were just mucking around or maybe, you know, you were just careless with your words, but they offended me. Can we sort this out? Common sense people that have a heart for the brethren will just be, yeah, of course, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't mean to say it that way or, oh, I did mean it. I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said those words. Let's sort this out. Let's move on. I'm sorry. It's going to happen. But you know what? It's so hard. It's so hard when you've been offended to go to that person and deal with it one by one. It's so much easier for some reason to go and tell everyone else. But here's why you don't go tell everyone else. Because I've offended a lot of people in my life. And a lot of the times that I've offended people, purely by accident. You know, I've told some of you guys I'm very sarcastic. I like to make jokes. I like to laugh. And you know, when you laugh, you laugh at your expense. And sometimes you laugh at someone else's, else's expense, right? Because that's what makes things funny. You know, when you find faults of one another, you have a bit of a laugh about it. But sometimes that person is not in the right mindset to laugh about that situation. And I've had a laugh about it. And they've got offended. Now, I didn't mean to hurt them. I didn't mean to upset them, all right? I, and sometimes I'm not even aware but there comes Christina, my wife, up to me. Kevin, you offended that person. I'm like, are you, are you serious? I was like, okay, all right, I better go sort it out, okay? But here's why you don't go and tell everyone else, okay? Is because that person may just honestly may not have meant it. It wasn't their intention to do that, okay? You got offended. And if you go and tell everyone else, you're taking that person's name and you're dragging it through the mud. You're making things worse. In fact, your offense to that person by going and spreading what they've done could be 10 times, 100 times worse than what they've done to you. What you do to their name, what you do to their repu reputation could be so much worse than the little thing they may have done to offend you. Take it to that person alone. And let me tell you, honestly, 99% of the times, it will be sorted out if you just do that. If you just go to that person alone. So like, I'll go to my pastor. I don't want to hear it. If you've not gone to that person one-on-one, -on -one, I don't want to hear it. Okay? If you come to me and say, look, someone's done something, what do I do, pastor? That's different. I will say to you, go to that person one-on-one -on -one alone. And go, so I don't need to know. Just go and sort it out with that person alone. All right? Let's keep going. Verse number 16. Verse number 16. Now, this is the case when if, after you've done that, it still hasn't worked out. Verse number 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. That's one or two more witnesses. That in the mouth of two, uh, two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So now it's been escalated. You've gone to brother so-and-so. They don't want to sort it out. Say, so what's the next step? You know, we want to resolve this. Well, now you take two or three witnesses. And that could be your pastor. That, you know, but I would, I, would, I would say these should not be your best friends that will always have your back. These should be impartial, mature believers. Your brother so-and-so, I have a situation with, an, with a person. 
I need two or three witnesses. Would you come and listen to this conversation? Why is it important to have impartial listeners? It's because you may be tainted with bitterness, and so you may think this person has not accepted you or whatever, but when the witness is here, they might hear that it's actually you, the, you're the one of the problem. You're the one that has, is not letting that go. That person's willing to move on, but for you, you're not satisfied and you, you know, you're making things worse. You need impartial listeners to come and sort things out. Or if that person is truly not wanting to hear from you, truly not wanting to resolve things, at least now you have the weight of other witnesses to reinforce, yes, this person has tried to sort it out, we've confirmed this, and let's keep going. If that person still would not hear, if that person still does not want to sort out the conflicts, in verse number 17, it says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Let me just stop here for a minute. Most preachers will say to you, the church age has not started yet. All right? The New Testament church age has not begun yet. Jesus Christ is teaching, take it to the church. Right here, right before his death, before his resurrection. He's saying, take it to the church. And this is what you do. If someone has not heard you, after the witnesses, you get, it gets brought before the whole church. And if the church is in agreement, the person that does not want to resolve the problem will be treated as a publican, as a heathen. What's a heathen? A non-believer. It's not saying this person's not a non-believer. It's saying just treat them like a non-believer. Of course, the church ought to be a place for believers to be gathered together, and the church is not a place for non-believers. And so what do you do? You kick that person out of the church. You treat him as a publican, a heathen man, someone that does not believe in the Lord. You treat him, you cast him out of church, you kick him out. Okay, if they don't want to resolve the problem. Okay, so please don't let your conflicts go unresolved. If you have a conflict with someone in the church today, then you need to go and sort it out. You need to go and take that to that person one-on-one, all right? And, it's, and if you've done that and it's still not resolved, then you need to take two or three witnesses. But I've never seen a case where that's ever had to happen. Quite often, people don't take it one-on-one. They make it so much worse, you know, and then, you know, the conflict's so much more hard to manage and, and to sort out, okay? So please do things in accordance to God's Word. Look at verse number 18. Verse number 18. So you've tried to resolve it with that person. You could not be able, you, you, weren't unable, you weren't able to, so the church has kicked them out, treated them as a heathen, a publican. Verse number 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What is this teaching? If brethren resolve their conflicts, it's resolved in heaven. If, if, if you loosen it, it's loosed in heaven. You know, if God sees a church sort out a matter, as far as God is concerned, I don't need to get involved, it's sorted out, okay? But if there's a situation, a conflict that's not resolved, someone's kicked out of the church, well, it's still not resolved in heaven. And God's judgment, God's justice will come upon that person that's been kicked out. That's what it's teaching here in verse 18. Let's keep reading. Verse 19, again, I say unto you that if two of, two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them, for my Father. So I'll read that. Let me just start over and read it again. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So basically what's being confirmed by Jesus is here. If, you, if the church is in agreement, you know, then as far as God is concerned, um, sorry, yeah, if, 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 we, it's, if we're in agreement as a church, then... Um, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in... It's, 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 God's approving of it. It's basically what he's saying. You know, as far as God in heaven is concerned, he's approved of that decision of that agreement that's occurred in church. Okay, again, if you cast someone out, the church, the church is in agreement in that. The Father is in agreement of that. Okay? Why? Because in verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You see, even when a church makes a decision like that, when a church is in agreement... The reason why a church can be in agreement is because Christ is in the midst of us. Christ is already here. The decisions we make as a church, where the body of Christ, the Bible calls us, is because Christ is in the midst. And that's why we always seek the Lord's leading. That's why we seek the Holy Ghost to empower us, to guide us, to lead us. Is because the, church, the decisions that a church make is as though God the Father has made that in heaven. Okay, so let's keep reading. Verse number 21. Verse number 21. 
Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Now, well, Peter's being a little bit, is, is sarcastic the right word? Well, even seven times? You think I should, even seven times, God, you know, is that how much I should forgive that person? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. <laughs> so Jesus just plays the game, right, with Peter. Just more than seven times, Peter. 70 times seven. 490 times you ought to forgive your brother. In other words, it's not like you need to keep record. Has this guy, got, is, is he close to 490? You know, he's sinned, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, sinned against me 489 times. One more time and I can finally not have to forgive this guy. That's what he's saying, obviously, okay? Obviously, you always forgive. If they come repentant, asking for forgiveness, saying sorry, then you ought to forgive them every time is what Jesus Christ is saying, okay? And, uh, you know, once again, if you've been offended by someone in this church and they come and say sorry, but sometimes the only way they'll know, when you say, well, see, they're not coming to say sorry. Did you go and approach it to them one-on-one? -on -one? Do they even know you got offended by them? Do they even realize you've been bothered by that? Probably not. That's probably why they've not even come to say sorry. But look, if they do come and apologize and say sorry, you ought to forgive them, all right? It's one of the hardest things in life is to say sorry. One of the hardest things to apologize or to forgive other people. But it's such an important thing. I mean, God's forgiven us, you know? And we'll see soon that he compares his forgiveness to us with how we ought to forgive our brethren. Verse number 23, please. Verse 23. We'll end on this story. It says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Uh, but for as much as he had, had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So obviously this story, the Lord here is a, a picture of the Lord God. And all of us have sin. All of us have something to pay. We all one day have to pay for our sins. Either Jesus Christ has taken that and paid it himself in his body on the tree on the cross, or you decide to pay for it for all eternity in hell. Okay, so this is the story that's been pictured here. This man, owing his Lord, but unable to pay. Uh, verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped, worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him. The debt. See, that's exactly the same thing, right? We come before God and we, we, we call out to Him and we, we ask Him for, to, patience, to have patience, to be merciful to us, you know, through Jesus Christ. And the Lord here moved with compassion, loosed Him, forgave Him the debt. That's exactly what we've gone through in our lives, okay? God has forgiven our debt because Jesus Christ has paid for it all. You know, praise God for that. But the key, the key to forgiveness is found here in verse 27. And this is, what, this is the key that a lot of Christians don't have with their brothers and sisters in Christ. What did he say? He was moved with compassion. Okay, if you are unable to forgive your brethren, if you're unable to go and say sorry for something you've done, you're lacking compassion. Okay? And yet the Lord God had compassion upon you. Okay? So what do you need to have on your brethren then? Obviously compassion. Let's keep reading verse 28. But the same servant went, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. So he owed him much less than what he owed the Lord. Okay? And it says here, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. <coughs> and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me. So he's asking the same thing, right? Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debts. I'm reminded of a story here. It's not really related, but I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, I was down in Liverpool once, uh, and I got a junkie saved. Like, just, just a full-blown junkie. You know, I, I gave him the gospel. He bowed his head. He prayed. He got saved. Literally, a few moments later, after he received Christ as Savior, I said, well, now you're on your way to heaven. You can be sure you're going to heaven. Some other junkie walks up to him, and he's like, hey, you owe me $30. <laughs> right, you, you know, I lent you that money, you went out, you bought smokes or whatever, you still haven't paid me back. What are you going to do about it? And I, I, I quickly turned to this passage. <laughs> Sorry, I said, like, can I just show you this? And I just showed him, you know. And the other guy was asking, like, please forgive me, give me more time. Give me more. It's only like 30 bucks, something small, right? Something tiny. But you know how these junkies are, they, you know, they, they can't manage their money properly. And uh, 
So I showed him that story. I just thought it was kind of funny. And then I showed him, he goes, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, God's really forgiven me. And I was like, you know, give that guy a bit more time. You know, <laughs> be, be patient with that guy, just like God was more patient with you. But let's keep reading. Verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now look at this. Now, first of all, if you're saved, you can never go to hell. I don't want you to think that this story is about someone losing their salvation. It's not. But it's still a very important principle here. Let's look at it. Verse number 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. All right? Do you see? Now, this is not about salvation. Okay? This is not about salvation. When you're saved, your position before God is righteous, is perfect because of Jesus Christ. That's your position. Then you have your walk with the Lord. Okay? Your fellowship with the Lord. And your fellowship, your walk with the Lord can be tainted by your sins. In fact, when you walk in darkness, you have no fellowship with God whatsoever because there's no darkness in God whatsoever. That's why the Bible teaches us that we should go to the Lord and confess our sins. You know, confess our sins daily so we can continue maintaining that walk and fellowship with God. Not for salvation, but just to have the presence of God in our life. Be walking in His ways, walking in the Spirit. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If someone has to come and apologize to you, they've done wrong for you, and you've not forgiven that person, you still hold bitterness in your heart against that person, well, when you go before the Lord and confess your sins, you're, they're gonna, God's not going to forgive you fully because until you have forgiven your brethren fully for what they've done to you. Okay? Your walk with the Lord will be tarnished. Okay? It'll be defiled, as it were, until you forgive your brethren for what they've done against you. Okay? This is not the only place the Bible teaches this. Please, we've already covered this. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Just in case you're wondering, is this, is this really right? Is this, is this true doctrine? Yes, it is. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible, this is Jesus once again speaking. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Hey, there's a condition. You know, how will God forgive you in your walk with the Lord? If you forgive other men their trespasses against you. Look at verse number 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Hey, do you want to be walking with the Lord? You know, if you want to be counted, as it were, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, do you think the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is someone that's holding grudges against their brethren, that hasn't forgiven their brethren, their brethren has come and said sorry, they've done wrong, or maybe they've offended you, but you've not gone one-on-one -on -one that person to sort it out. You know, you've, you've held it against them, but you've not done your work, the, the step of you going and trying to sort it out with that person. If you've not done that, if you've been offended by a brother, if you have divisions, conflicts with brethren in the church, you know, you cannot forgive them for what they've done. So how do I know if I'm not forgiving them? Bitterness in the heart. Bitterness in the heart can grow and, and, and destroy your life. Okay? You need to go and sort this out. If you've not done that to your brethren, then the Lord God's not going to forgive you in your spiritual walk with Him. You're not going to be able to walk in, in the pureness that, that He wants to walk, in the, in the fullness of the light that God wants you to walk with Him. Okay? So this is an important thing, guys. Okay, we, you know, we, we, we can rebuke the world when they persecute us. We can rebuke, you know, those that offend us, the unsaved, the ungodly, the reprobates. It's easy to do that. It's harder to rebuke ourselves, you know, when we've done wrong against the brethren or we have not come with a forgiving heart with the brethren. So please make sure if you have conflicts, if you have division, let me just say, first of all, it's normal. It happens to everybody. Okay, that's, 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 the, that's normal. That's, you should expect that. But what's not normal is when you don't forgive one another, okay? So if anyone's like that today, let me encourage you, sort it out one-on-one -on -one with that person, all right? Let's pray.